if you want to have a business that has a great culture, you need people that you can be open with and people you trust. You also need people that will help you capitalize on the opportunities and minimize the challenges. everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for tuning in, for showing up, and for always sharing, sharing our shows, but also sharing how you're doing, how you're feeling, and what's going on in your world. We appreciate you. Well, it is a new week, another guest, and an interesting journey, and plenty of insights for you. The topic today is, is your business ready for investors. That's right. <laughs> Do you know and what steps would you take? Well, I have a CEO and founder who certainly can speak to this topic. Joining me on the show is Brett Hickey. He's the CEO and founder of Star Mountain Capital, which is a specialized asset manager. And Star Mountain has about $2 billion in assets under management. Now, Brett himself has spent 20 plus years in private investing and investment banking. 15 plus of those years have been focused on the US lower middle market, which he can explain to you. And he's also completed over 125 private equity, private credit, and secondary fund investments. I could go on and on about Brett, but I think it's time he joins the conversation. Brett, welcome, welcome to the show. Thanks, Deidre, a pleasure to be here. Well, it is great to have you. So I just lined you up as the person who can answer the questions. But before we get to small business and being investor ready, maybe you could just share a little bit about your journey. Did you always know that you wanted to be a CEO of an asset management firm? The very simple answer is not at all. Uh, all I've really done my whole life for the most part is chase various passions. And what I've learned in life is that it helps a lot if you create some strategy and a business plan before you just drive passion into things. But earlier on was really just chasing passion, chasing things that seemed interesting to me. That's interesting because I mean, it always depends on the entrepreneur, on the person. Um, I find it interesting that I guess as a part of your passion, you do have this focus on, I mentioned it in the intro, the lower middle market. And I would love for you to be able to define that. And also, why is that so interesting from an investment standpoint? The lower middle market is very interesting for us because it represents roughly 50% of the entire U.S. economy. So into itself, it would be approximately the 11th largest market in the world. And it is an extremely fragmented market with a lot of different business owners that have a lot of great ideas, a lot of great businesses that often don't really know how to take them to the next level. You overlay that with the aging demographic that we have in the US and that creates a lot of need for strategic advice and strategic capital partners. When we think about the United States, we think a lot about very efficient capital markets, a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, the vast majority of that is geared towards much bigger companies where investment banks, consultants, and others can make a lot more fee revenue. Smaller companies are just not of interest to them for the most part. And my mission in starting Star Mountain 11 years ago was to bring the large market expertise and resources into the smaller businesses. And where that was a fun tie together of two of my passions one, I do really like finance. I know many people think of finance as boring. I think it's actually quite creative and interesting. But I also like building. Building is fun, being entrepreneurial. And by helping smaller businesses grow, I find that we get to have the best of both worlds where it is investing, it is strategic, it is finance, but it's also focused on really rolling up our sleeves and working with businesses to take them to the next level. And to define the lower middle market, we generally think of it as companies that have between 15 million, 
and approximately 250 million in annual revenues. Mm -hmm. So we are not experts with startups. That's a different ecosystem. We're experts in helping take high quality established businesses and really helping them create a vision for the future and then help them execute against that and help provide the financing and capital solutions to assist them in doing such. This is really interesting. So you mentioned the high quality established. You also mentioned the 15 to the 200 million. What is it specifically? Because I think a lot of businesses hope that they would fit the build. But when you're looking at a business, how do you determine this high quality? What is it that you're looking for to help all those businesses out there who might fit this build? Yeah, it's very subjective in, in that case of what is great. And, and I think first off, we built a business that starts with industry top down. So there are certain industries that are just harder to make money in. Mm -hmm. One of my good friends who was the best man at my wedding is actually now a business partner of mine used to have a saying that all ladders are just as hard to climb. So make sure you put your ladder up against the right wall. And <laughs> yeah. It sounds very simple, but it, it's actually interesting when you think about that. If you're going to put a lot of effort into something, make sure that it's a, a value. So we start with industries that have positive tailwinds associated with them. Technology, healthcare, there, it's a wide range, business services, transportation, logistics. There are a lot of type of companies that have very positive fundamental aspects to them. And there are other industries that less fit our desires that are much more volatile. So when you think about oil and gas or commodities, that would be a good example of something quite volatile. You can make money in it, certainly, but it's not what we've chosen to become deep experts in. So we look at industries that we think that have a strong probability of growing. That's step one. We then look for businesses that have high quality products and services and associated diverse and high quality and customer bases. So that at the end of the day, it's a lot of it comes down to your predictability of generating and retaining revenues. You can deal with expenses. You can work with optimizing expenses. If you don't have any revenue, the rest gets pretty tough. And then it gets deeper into management teams, alignment of interest and things of that nature, um, having proper balance sheets structured so that if you have an idiosyncratic risk or a macroeconomic risk, that you have a fighting chance to work through the challenges. Well, thank you for explaining that. And as you share all of this, I just wonder, Throughout your career, have you and all the companies and all the investments that you've done, was there ever a, a moment, you know, Brett, when you get that aha moment and something really sticks because you feel so strongly about it and then it guides you throughout your career? Has anything ever happened to you that's really stuck? I thought a lot about this. My aha moment is really alignment of interest and quality of people. And what do I mean by quality of people? Because once again, this is something subjective. So I'll preemptively describe it, knowing that you'll ask me about it. If not, <laughs> it's really about people that have high ethics, high integrity. And if you want that out of people and you want them aligned with you, I think economic alignment is critical. Having grown up in a very small town of 10,000 people in Northwestern Canada and speed skated on the national team and been very involved in my local community, um, partially because my mother died of cancer uh, when I was very young. And so we do a lot to give back. And I, she used to work for IBM uh, prior to that and then taught entrepreneurship. And so I feel like part of my legacy is honoring her legacy. And, and um, we do a lot around ESG and, and diversity and so forth at Star Mountain as part of that, which I think is just good business sense also. But at the end of the day, when you take that, which that community to me was normal, I didn't think about it. I was just put into it. I then moved to New York City and in New York City, starting in investment banking, investment banking, a lot of passionate, driven, intelligent people. But one of the words that you wouldn't hear a lot of is probably loyalty or alignment. It's people chasing the shiniest coin and always looking for the greener pastures. 
And there were elements of that that I really took a lot from and liked, but there were elements from my upbringing that I thought were very valuable and important. And that's what I've tried to meld together at Star Mountain. And what I've learned over the last 20 or so years of being in investment banking in the last nearly 17 years in private equity and private credit is that if you want to have a business that has a great culture, you need people that you can be open with and people you trust. You also need people that will help you capitalize on the opportunities and minimize the challenges. I always think of it like an S that you hope is up and to the right. You capitalize on the upswings, you mitigate the downswings. And if you can do that over a long period of time, that's where you create a lot of economic value for yourself and your shareholders. And so to do that, you really want a loyal, invested, dedicated team that are there to work through the challenges, not just that are good at popping champagne. And I think that alignment of interest has really helped drive culture because, look, if you want people to stick around through the challenges, you know, it, it makes sense that they should be motivated to do so. And therefore, that's probably my biggest aha moment is don't deviate from the quality and integrity of people and making sure that you have transparent, aligned interests. Well, you just made my heart happy <laughs> when you said ethics, integrity, loyalty, alignment, of course, trust. All of these are so important. And really, it's all about the relationship. Relationships are super important today. And it you're speaking to that in the sense of your team, but also the companies that you align with as well. So that's really important. Tell me something. With everything that goes on in your world, uh, hear the word investment, and certainly there's got to be stress. <laughs> you know, it's Monday and it could be a crazy day, normal crazy or crazy crazy. But how do you manage the, the daily stress of what you do? Stress is a focal point of mine. And when I hire people, I often really try to get to know them intimately. Uh, we just brought on another senior executive and I made a point of dinner with him and his wife prior and, and really get to know people as well as you can personally and try to get under the hood to understand what stresses are going to impact them. And often they'll say, which this gentleman also did, hey, that's, that's, I shouldn't really go there. That's not your problem. And I said, well, we're business partners. It is. If you have challenges, that's going to impact your personal life and your professional life because it's just one life. And to me as an entrepreneur and growing up in a small town, not coming to this country with resources or backgrounds or networks or anything like that to help me, I had no choice but to have my entire life all built into one. And I still do to this day. And I actually now uh, find it very valuable, but therefore stresses are positive stress and negative stress. Mm -hmm. And I like to have positive stress, which is setting goals, making them transparent, dashboards, KPIs, some of those words. And I try to really run our business that way. So we're very focused on goal setting, goal measurement, and collaborating to help each other achieve them at our best and highest use and minimizing negative stresses. And for each of us, what causes us stress is probably a little bit different. And I talked to my wife a lot about this even. So what things do you like doing? What things do you not like doing? We have young children, as sure. you would know, young children generally, um, at least ours, come with a lot of different stress. I love them. They're the most joyful thing in my <laughs> life, but they're also, you know, when you're getting woken up multiple times a night or say, please don't do this. And it's just like, you might as well not have even said, please don't do it because they're just going to do whatever they want anyways. <laughs> Those type of things cause for a lot of different stresses. And so for me, bringing that back into a business sense, although I think personal matters tremendously, it's health, wellness, uh, fitness. For me, I used to speed skate on the national team, as you know, uh, I had it on the national training team while I was going to college and was a gold medalist. And so speed skating has always been something that was part of my life. Speed skating is not a part of my life anymore, but sports still is. I now do shorter Olympic distance triathlons. I've one coming up this weekend. And oh, what great. I like about Olympic triathlons, for me, I get to set goals, be driven with it, but it's not an Ironman that really is going to compete with the rest of my life. 
I find that shorter races for me are complementary. It gives me a motivation to eat healthier, sleep better, which helps me be more energetic, more mentally aware, more mentally sharp. But it's not something where I have to train 20 or 30 hours a week that would ultimately either sacrifice business or family. So I find shorter races, and does that be racing? Can be people playing tennis, whatever it might be, doing classes, something that you get energy from and is healthy. Um, I find that to be an extremely important part for me in being able to manage stress. And the reading I've done around it tells me that I will always have stress, especially my lifestyle. And I appreciate it. Look, I bite off a lot. I have a lot of ambitions. We drive hard. And so I have to admit to myself, well, if you're going to drive hard, you're going to have a lot of challenges, right? Definitively. And so you have to be good at managing stress and not having it impact you. And then if there are things that systematically bother you, asking yourself, how can you change that? Because you either change your own behavior or you change the situation. So I also help create a lifestyle where I try to have a lot of support infrastructure around me to assist me in hopefully focusing on my best and highest uses. And that helps me manage stress, but nutrition, food, exercise, um, and positive people. I think having an awareness of your surrounding, I'm fortunate and unfortunate, depends how you look at it, having no family or support anywhere around is a negative on some cases, but on the other hand, it allows you to curate your own environment and become very involved with the community and choose the type of friendships and relationships and people that you want to spend time with. I think that has a big impact on one's life as well. It does. All of the choices that you make. And when you mention supporting yourself, it, it sounds like you do a lot of mentoring as a CEO, but do you have mentors? Are there people around you that you look to um, as your support? I do. And I'm constantly looking for more, although now it's much different than what it was before. So going back to when I started, I started my first business in the late 90s was a work placement agency in the healthcare industry that I was able to build and have fun and sell, not for anything financially relevant, but it was fun and it was, it was exciting and I enjoyed making the logo and the business card and the branding and stuff. That was a lot of fun. Uh, when I started my first asset management firm in 2004, um, you know, it was very different, a lot of different you know, learning. So when I think about the support infrastructure that you know I try to build around me and my business, it's really focused on where I think I need the most help. And that's ever evolving. So back in 2004, yes, I was good at modeling spreadsheets as an investment banker on Wall Street and understood numbers and, and that part of it. But I had very little network or skills in building a business. And so the entrepreneurs organization, EO, was a great organization where you could have a smaller startup business and have a peer group of other people struggling and saying, hey, I have $10,000 and I want to try to do an advertising budget with it. Well, EO was a great network at taking a little bit of money and trying to do something with it and having a network of people that we're all going through similar challenges as my business grew, I then joined the Young Presidents Organization, YPO, approximately 13 years ago, which we're now in two different chapters for that. And that was really helpful, having an independent board, they call the forum, really an independent board of people that can, you can really, again, trust each other. That's good. Right? Full transparency and making sure that you have people in your life that you don't have to put a filter on. You can be truly transparent with. I think that's critical uh, and YPO was able to get me that. And then I um, did a program at Harvard Business School and at the Innovatrium in Michigan that were really formative as well for me. And that's all evolved into now where I have quite a large advisory network and I've created concentric circles of excellence. Some of them are around communication. Mm -hmm. Some of them are around talent development, uh, both internal and external, because I think talent at the end of the day is one of the most important things of any business. And as a CEO, I think that's one of my most important things is strategy and, and talent. And therefore I create different concentric groups of people that help advise me. So I always have two to three people I can quickly go to that 
we can have rapid conversation because they know me, they know the business, and we can quickly talk about whatever it is to hopefully make better informed and more strategic decisions in how you build your business. And I also think an individual network, having good friends that you can really be open and trusted with. And there are organizations like EO and YPO that can also help with that. In fact, many of my close friends I've met through that, and we've all learned a similar language and understand that it's a zero tolerance rule for trust. Right. There's no such thing as being kind of trustworthy, right? You are fully Yeah, that's a hard line. Right, it's a hard line. Because if not, you get kicked out of the organization. And therefore, when you have that common language with people, those rules of how you govern yourselves, that's, um, as I reflect in this conversation, a big percentage of my friends I have met through that. Excellent. You know, it's interesting because in, in my book, the, the ethical marketers book I just wrote, you can't be kind of ethical. <laughs> you're either ethical or you're not. So it's the same thing. Same thing with trust. Brett, you have shared so many great insights. I can't even believe that it's time to give some parting advice. Just maybe share some last minute information, tips, top of mind for all the women worldwide network about their businesses, whether it's scaling or getting investment ready. A few items I'll part with. One is your point around your book, which I wholeheartedly agree with around ethics. It's a full, full on. I would suggest that it's your whole life. And I've often heard people say, well, it's just business. Like, well, it's just business. So that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't impact that person and their family right. because it's just business. Like help me understand that concept of it's just business. I think that's the, that's such a scapegoat and a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. So I would highly encourage people to say, you always are who you are and always be that person to high ethics, to high integrity. And when you practice always doing that and you practice a bright line where it's black and white, not gray, then I think it actually becomes very easy to make the right decisions and avoid risk. If you can build a great life and a great business, protecting it and protecting your family and things that you care about should become high value. And if you practice that lifestyle, I think it's a great way to live. You sleep much easier, you have less stress and negative anxiety and living in Greenwich and spending 20 years in Wall Street and finance. It's a lot of different people that I've known that have been, you know, riches to rags story. We all hear that the rags to riches and maybe it went that way and went back down again. I think if you can build something stronger and more stable, um, it really all stems from that ethics, integrity, and culture, ultimately, that you want to emulate to your firm and your team. Well, I really appreciate that you shared ethics as a part of your parting advice, because I agree, it is so important. And I said in my book, and I know you're going to agree with this, it's a personal choice and a business practice. That's right. Well, Brett, where can people find out more about you and Star Mountain Capital? The best places to look would be our website for one, starmountaincapital.com. Second is our LinkedIn page. And third is our YouTube channel that has a lot of different digital media content, podcasts, and interviews we've done with other CEOs. Um, very similar to how you live your life, bringing thought leadership, Deidre. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I hope everybody looks you up and learns more and really appreciate just your time, your insights and, and everything you've shared. So thank you. My pleasure. I wish everybody great success. Thank you. And a big thank you to all of you for tuning into Women Worldwide. You know where to find me. So keep those conversations going and the feedback coming. I'm at Dee Breckenridge on Twitter. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay, everybody. Until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.